Okay. Now, okay. That was an unusual time of uh, worship. That was definitely not meditated, premeditated. Happy Fourth of July. Um, I didn't think any of us were going to be repenting on July 4th, but God's ways are not our ways. I, I do believe it was the Lord moving. And we're just going to let the Lord move however he wants to move. Uh, Larry had an addition to uh, something he wanted to share. And I'm going to ask Larry to come up and share real quick. And while he's coming up, I'm going to preach the, the message, but it's going to be different than the way I was going to preach it before. Yeah, while well, I was repenting, I was praying. I was beginning to talk to the Lord, and I kept hearing in the spirit that uh, God loves us. That's why he's trying to get us there. He wants us to be in a place where he can really show his love with us to be a part of that. But that, it's not just that. The ones that are refusing to uh, leave the uh, old norm, as they say, the uh, 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 lukewarm, you can't survive with what's coming. What he's saying is that he's trying to get us in a place of survival because something is coming that only the, only yeah. the, the new new anointing can take us, take us there in survival. So I got that real strong. No, that's good. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, I want to read just real quick, just a scripture here. Revelation, when Larry was talking, this, this came to my heart to share with us. Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea, the Lord, the Lord says this in uh, verse 19. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. So what we have just experienced in a measure is the Lord bringing a measure of discipline to us to say, come back to your first love. And the Lord does that because he loves us. He loves us. And so I just don't want to, I just want to just say, don't get, don't let offense rise up in your heart. Don't let offense rise up in your heart. It's because of God's jealousy for us that he speaks sometimes with a, a firmness and a, a forthrightness to call us back when we have grown to a place where we can't hear the whispers of God. And so I just want to say God is doing this because of his love for us to discipline us. And he says, therefore, be zealous and repent. So what I'm going to do today in this message, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to talk about the parable of the ten virgins um, I was planning to talk about the parable of the ten virgins, but I was going to do it in a different way. I'm going I'm to change the message here just to flow with the moving of the Holy Spirit and the way the Lord has kind of come to us today. And uh, in Matthew chapter 25, I think one of the things that has become very clear in the prophetic speaking of the Lord as we have been waiting on him in worship, one of the things that's become very, very clear is that we are living here at the end of the age. There, there's no doubt we are living at the end of the age. I'm not saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow, but we are certainly living at the end of the age. And Jesus told a parable that has incredible relevance to us who live at the end of the age. In fact, in Matthew chapter 25, the Lord is responding to a question the disciples asked in Matthew 24. And the disciples asked Jesus, he was coming up out of, after he rebuked the leaders and he's, he's, he's pointing out to the, the disciples, hey, do you notice this temple? And do you notice these stones on this temple? Jesus was saying, I tell you, not one stone is going to be left unturned. In other words, he was predicting and telling them basically the Romans are coming in 70 AD and they are going to tear down this temple stone by stone. And the disciples looked at him and said, okay, Lord, are, we know, are you talking about the end of the age? Lord, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so Jesus goes through in Matthew 24, and scholars call it the Olivet Discourse, and he lists in there all the different things that are going to be happening at the end of the age. But then he comes to Matthew chapter 25, and the problem we have is uh, interpreters put in a chapter break and so we think okay well he's changed subjects 
The Lord has changed subjects and the Lord's moved on to something else. He's talking about the parable of the ten virgins. And that's not the case. The Lord is still emphasizing what it's going to be like in the church at the end of the age. And so he's talking about, he's talking about the end of the age here in Matthew 25. And so the Lord is speaking and he says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, I'm going to, in this message, it's, I'm telling you it's a little bit different. I'm going, to, I'm going to read the scripture here as it is in the original text. And then I'm going to give you what I believe is my personal interpretation of Matthew 25, having basically studied this, this parable for, I don't even know how, 25 plus years of studying this. I'm not going to go into explaining every little thing I'm going to say, but I'm going to uh, interpret it what I think this means. Verse 1, here's my interpretation. In the 21st century, the time in which we live as the church, the church is like a betrothed virgin, a betrothed bride waiting on her bridegroom to come for her and take her to the wedding. See, a lot of the times when we come to Matthew 25, we don't understand the background, the cultural background that was going on at that time. And so if you study ancient Jewish weddings, which Dad has laid out so great in his book, and I put it in the Eternal Blueprint as well, when you study ancient Jewish customs, you realize there were five phases of an ancient Jewish wedding. There was the matchmaking, there was the betrothal, there was the preparation period between the betrothal and the wedding, there was the wedding ceremony, and then there was the wedding feast. There were five phases of an ancient Jewish wedding. And so what Matthew 25 is telling us is the Lord is pointing out is that there has already been a match made in heaven. God the Father has arranged a marriage for his son. In fact, he has arranged it before time and creation. It's God's eternal purpose. It's God's ultimate intention. The father wants to give his son a bride, and he's made this determination before one act of creation. It's God's eternal purpose. And God has arranged a marriage for his son. God has arranged a bride for his son, and every single person in the nations has been invited to come and be the wife of the Lamb for all eternity. There has been, a, the Father is a matchmaker, the Holy Spirit is a matchmaker, and the Holy Spirit is calling out to the nations, come and be part of the bride of Christ, predetermined before time and creation in the eternal counsels of God. You have been invited to be part of the wife of the Lamb. Now for guys, <clears throat> that doesn't get us sometimes too excited. I mean, I remember I was having a conversation. I'm just going to call his name Dave. And we were talking, Dave and I, and truly Dave was, he could totally beat me up. He could beat me in arm wrestling. I mean, he looked like the guy you would pick on the football team. I mean, he was like burly and tough and strong. And so I was just talking to him and he's like, man, I got to be honest with you, Brian. Um, I'm having a real struggle with this whole bride, bride, bridegroom concept. I just can't really picture myself in a wedding dress. And so when he's talking to me, I'm I mean, he's really pouring his heart out to me. And he's really like, you know, feeling really, really guilty and bad. And, you know, he really is like looking for me to counsel him. But I swear, I could not think of any, I could not hear anything else he said. All I saw was this big muscular, muscular guy with a, you know, a beard. <clears throat> Look like he owns some motorcycles. And I'm just picturing him in a wedding dress. And so I just start laughing, and he notices that I'm laughing. And, you know, we just, we just started laughing together, and it was, it was really funny. But, you know, a, a lot of guys really think, okay, this whole bride thing doesn't really get me that excited. The ladies are a lot more interested in it than the guys are. But the guys are like, yeah, I just don't. It's too flowery and too much, you know, wedding dress and, you know, all this romance stuff. You know, I just want to go hunting or play football or work out or whatever. But it's not about God trying to emasculate us or God trying to make us less than men. It's about a relationship with the Son of God 
Him being the lover and you being the beloved. Him showering his love upon you and you responding as the beloved in, in a love relationship back to him. So God is, I just want to say, guys, you know, we don't have to be afraid of this idea of the bride-bridegroom relationship. We really can. Uh, you know, it's, it's really an incredible thing God's invited us into. It is the romance of the ages. The Lord, has in, the Lord is a romantic. Now, again, guys, that does not mean, okay, I'm not going to leave him go there, but, you know, thinking about the Lord as a romance, or God wants to woo your heart. God wants to woo your heart. God wants to draw you into this most incredible, deep, intimate relationship with him. I mean, we can't even fathom what it's like. The very intimacy that God the Father and God the Son shared before time and creation, Jesus is inviting us, men and women, into this very same intimate relationship. That's what it means to be the bride of Christ. It means that we would be baptized in the very love of the Father for his son that he burned with before time and creation. We have an incredible invitation. What an invitation God has given to us. What an incredible invitation. The father and the son have arranged a marriage for his beloved son. Many are called, you hearing this, are called into a, into a marriage relationship with Jesus Christ an eternal relationship of marriage to Jesus Christ. See, your earthly marriage is only but a shadow and a foreshadowing of your eternal marriage to the Son of God. So we are already right now in this phase of the matchmaking of God. The Holy Spirit has made an arranged marriage to the church of Jesus Christ. If you are born again, you have said yes. You may not have realized this. You may have just said, oh, I'm just trying to escape hell. But the Lord has invited you into a love relationship. You were now betrothed to Jesus Christ as his bride. And that brings us to the second phase of this Jewish wedding, the betrothal, the betrothal ceremony where the, the, once the, the groom and the bride were gonna, said, we're going to get married, they created a dowry and they created a kudaba or kudaba. It was like a marriage contract that said, okay, here's the stipulations of what it is to be married to the bridegroom. Is, here's the expectations of the bride. Here's the expectations of the bridegroom. And what also happened was the bride was examined for nine months or more to see, okay, was she really a virgin? And the bride was also, the bride was also required. You've got to consecrate yourself from every other love to devote yourself to the bridegroom. See, we probably should be that way more in our evangelism to say it's not just, you can't just walk down the aisle and say a prayer and think you're just heaven bound. It's a surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But then the third thing the bride did is she had to go and make her own wedding dress. And this betrothal, or this, this betrothal, or, or that was actually the third, that was actually in the, uh, the, the betrothal period. Sorry, I got my timeline mixed up. After the third phase is that preparation period or that betrothal period where the bride would then make her own wedding dress. And, you know, she couldn't go to Day's bridal shop and just buy a dress there. She had to go and stitch by stitch make her own wedding dress, and she had to be ready because she didn't know when the bride, bridegroom was going to come. At any moment, the father, and the father didn't tell the son in this Jewish wedding custom, hey, son, go get your bride. She, she, she did not know, or he did not know, when he was coming. So at all times, she had to be ready. She had to have her wedding dress made, and she had to have it uh, handy so she could put on in a moment's notice. And so now, verse 2, this is my paraphrase. We'll read the, the scripture, and then I'll read it out of my paraphrase. Five of, the, five, of them, the, five of the ten virgins were foolish, and five were wise. And so here's my interpretation. During this preparation period, between the betrothal and the wedding ceremony, half of the church will respond in a foolish way. 
not taking the marriage of the king of kings serious. The other half, on the other hand, are going to respond wisely, and they are going to prepare themselves to be the bride who is worthy of the king. Let me say this just from personal experience. We need to make our betrothal to Jesus Christ the number one thing in our lives. The number one thing in our lives. You were created to be married to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I believe that so much of the church has lost this divine seriousness that, that needs to come back to the church related to this relationship. I don't think we take God very seriously. I mean, the Lord, I'm not saying you have to walk around depressed or like always serious, but I'm saying you can have joy and you can at the same time take this call serious. This should be the most important thing in your life. But it comes down to the Lord, the Lord himself is giving us. See, a lot of us want to know, okay, what is the Lord saying in the end times? What is the Lord saying in the end times? And they're going all over the place to hear prophets and prophecies. And they want to hear about this and that and what God's going to do in America and what God's going to do politically and all that. Yet here Jesus is giving us the, one of the clearest prophecies in, in history written in Scripture in red letters telling us, I'm, you know, he's basically saying, guys, I'm telling you what it is like right now in the times you are living in. Half of the church is going to respond in a foolish way. Half of the church is going to respond in a wise way. There, there, there really is not a middle ground. So the question is, are you responding in wisdom or are you responding foolishly? And I'm telling you, it's easy to respond foolishly. It is so easy without even realizing it. We can just, the cares of life just start piling on, not even doing anything bad, just enjoying life, eating, drinking, marrying and being in marriage, whatever, just living life in the cares of life without even realizing it, you've all of a sudden slipped from your first love. You've all of a sudden grown cold. You've all of a sudden become a, a foolish virgin lacking oil and you don't even know it. And I'm telling you, it can happen so easy without us even knowing it. So that's verse 2. How are we going to respond in this betrothal, this period between the betrothal ceremony and the wedding? Are we going to respond with wisdom or are we going to respond foolishly? The other thing I will say when it comes to this, when it comes to knowing about the ten virgins is we've got to understand is the way God views us. A lot of times we don't want to, a lot of times we're like, feel like God's always mad at us. God's always like in a bad mood about us. God's always like feeling like we're not doing enough, we're not, we're not seeking him enough. And again, we had that today, so you're probably like, well, yeah, it's your fault. You always are saying that to us, Brian. But the, the thing is, is, is God looks at you, and because of the finished work of the cross, God looks at you like a pure virgin. God looks at you, and that word virgin actually means marriageable maiden, God looks at you and says, because of the finished work of the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ has broken off of you condemnation, shame, and guilt. You are, in the eyes of God, like a pure virgin. God has targeted his love upon you. God is freeing you. In Jesus Christ, you are more than a conqueror. In Jesus Christ, you have died to sin, self, and the law. God looks at you through the eyes of your legal position in Jesus Christ, and he says, you are righteous in Christ. You are like a pure virgin. What an incredible God he is to do that. Not only that, but Paul, Paul talks about this, that we have been joined to Christ spirit to spirit. Just like a husband and a wife become one flesh, the church through our born-again conversion, regeneration by the Spirit of God, our spirit 
is now one spirit with God himself. That's incredible. Your spirit, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, your spirit is one spirit with him. That's amazing. That is so amazing. Your human spirit and the Holy Spirit, the very one we read about in Genesis chapter 1, hovering over creation, forming dark, uh, forming things out of the dark and formless void, forming him, forming the creation, the very God who raised Jesus from the dead, he lives inside of you. You're one spirit with him. Just as in a marriage, a man shall leave the father and mother and become one flesh, you and your betrothal when you were saved and born again, you are one spirit with the Holy Spirit. How incredible. How incredible. God's love for us, his betrothed bride, is beyond anything we could ask, think, or imagine. We just can't even comprehend the incredible love of the bridegroom for us. God's love for you. God's love for you is so beyond your human ability to understand it. In, fi in fact, Paul says that the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ surpasses knowledge. You cannot articulate God's burning, jealous love for you. Now, that doesn't mean God's always nice. We sometimes think, okay, God's love means he's always nice. Now, that, he, he is nice, he is kind, but he has a jealousy for us. He has a burning fire for us. His eyes are like blazing fire. And it's that fire in his eyes is the jealousy he has for you and for me. See, in this relationship, in, in eternity past, the father was the, was the one, he, the father was the one, he loved the son, and the son then loved him back in return. And in the eternal counsels, I, I just imagine it was something like this. This is don't, I mean, this is just my own interpretation of the scriptures, but I just believe. In, this, in the eternal counsels, the father was said something like this to his son. Son, I am going to give you a beloved. And you are going to be the source of love in this relationship. Even right now, as I am the source of love in our relationship, I love you and you return my love back. And however all that works, in this relationship, you are going to be the source of love to a beloved. And that beloved is going to respond back to you and love you back with my very own love. And so what, what God did is he put the Son of God, like Adam, he put him into a deep sleep on the cross, so to speak. And when the Roman soldier pierced his rib with that spear, outpoured from the side of Jesus, the second Adam, outpoured from that side of Jesus was blood and water. The blood typifying the, the justification by faith. By the blood of Jesus, you have now been justified and saved. The, the water typifying the Holy Spirit who had now come to dwell inside of you. In other words, what was happening was just like we see in the garden between Adam and Eve, when Adam was put into that deep sleep, Christ on the cross was as the second Adam. God was pulling out of Christ the very bride of his bride, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, more, more I guess accurately, spirit of his very spirit. You have come forth from Christ. You are like Eve, and he is the second Adam. When you're born again, it's way more than just dying and going to heaven. When you're born again, the very spirit of the Son of God and his very DNA is placed inside of you, just like God took from Eve the rib out of Adam and formed Eve from his rib. God took the spirit of his son and placed the spirit of his son into you and into me, into the church. And we became the betrothed bride 
of Christ. Isn't that incredible? We became the beloved, and he is the lover. He is the lover of your soul. He is madly in love with you. He is pursuing you. He has chosen you. He is chasing you. He is going after you. He is madly in love with you. Don't ever let the devil tell you God is not in love with you. Don't ever let the, te the devil tell you God has rejected you, that you are forsaken. God is pursuing you as a bridegroom so that you would be his beloved bride. That's what it means to be betrothed to Jesus Christ. Now we keep going here. Verse 3. But when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. In other words, here's my paraphrase. The foolish ones in the church, being betrothed to Christ, saved, justified, and heaven-bound, they did not cultivate an internal relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit, whereby they know the Father and the Son intimately. Therefore, the light of their first love for the Son will go out when the bridegroom comes unexpectedly. See, the foolish, they're saved, they're justified, they're heaven-bound, that God loves them, but they did not pursue the Lord in the way he pursued them. And therefore, when he comes, they have no relationship with him or they have a very weak relationship with him. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. They're still going to heaven, but it means that they don't have that intimacy with Christ. That's why I'm saying your marriage relationship to Jesus Christ is the most important thing about your life. Your marriage, your betrothal to Jesus Christ is the most important thing about your life. But a lot of us don't live that way, do we? We let other cares, other pursuits, other loves, other relationships, other things get in the way of that bridal relationship with Jesus. And when we do, we're easily moving down this path of being like a foolish virgin. Number four, verse four. But the prudent took oil, the wise took oil in their flask along with their lamps. This is the way I paraphrase this. But the wise ones in the church, they're the ones who establish and cultivate a history with the Lord in the secret place, and they develop an internal intimacy with Jesus by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a, a question. Is do you have a personal history with God in the secret place? Does he know you? I'm not talking about omnisciently. Obviously, he knows you omnisciently. He knows the numbers of head, hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows everything you think. He knows every thought. He knows what you're, what you're going to say before you say it. I'm not talking about an omniscient knowing of the Lord. But do you have a secret history of going deep in the secret place with Jesus internally of an inward knowing of Christ. John 17, 3 says, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, talking about the Father, and they may know the Son whom you have sent. Eternal life is not merely a destination. See, so many times in the evangelical church, we think eternal life is a destination. Eternal life is dying and going to heaven. No, eternal life is the indestructible life of God being placed in you when you're born again. The uncreated, untreated, sovereign, uh, un, you know, just undefiled, indestructible 
life of God being placed into your spirit. That's eternal life. It never goes away. And through that life, that indwelling life, you can know God inwardly. Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The deep things of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have access to the Holy Spirit inside of you who knows the very deep things of God. And God reveals those deep things of God to your heart so you can know him. You can know God. And I, I've been walking this path. I tell you, there's nothing like it. The relationship you've been invited into, that I've been invited into, you, there's nothing like knowing him internally, intuitively, by the Spirit of God revealing God to us. There's nothing like it. And so the wise virgins were those who developed a secret history in God. When the bridegroom delayed, they said, okay, we, my marriage to Jesus Christ is the most important thing about my life. I am going to prioritize everything in my life around this betrothal, and I am going to do everything I can to press in to know him. Paul said it best in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him. At the end of his life, Paul was saying, I'm not content knowing about him. I'm not content writing much of the New Testament. I have got to know Christ. May that be the cry of our heart. See, it's going to be at the end of the age, which we are fast approaching. Light and darkness are both going to increase at the same time. I mean, we're seeing it right now, aren't we, in our nation and around the world. Just crazy, craziness has exploded exponentially of moral decay and depravity. I mean, I never thought I would see the gross things we're seeing just normalized in our culture. Darkness is increasing, but I'm telling you, God's light is increasing upon the sons of God. God's light is increasing upon the sons of God, upon the wise virgins who are cultivating this intimate knowledge with him in the secret place. See, when the bridegroom comes and we don't have a secret history with him in the secret place, we're not going to be able to just turn our lamps on, which re represent first love for him. We're not going to just be able to turn our lamps on and just shine brightly all of a sudden when he comes if we haven't been seeking him with our whole lives. The foolish virgins are going to realize, I wasted my life living for myself, but the wise virgins are going to say, I am now, because I have a secret history in God, I can easily shift into that burning passion for him because I have that relationship with him. Verse 5. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. This encourages me. Because even the wise virgins fall asleep. <laughs> That's encouraging, okay? Even the, the most anointed, wise virgins in the church can grow lukewarm and apathetic. And so God's got to kind of do what he did to us this morning, jolt us out of our slumber and sleep and apathy and lukewarmness and say, wake up. See, all of us can grow drowsy. All of us can get weary. All of us can fall asleep. Just the natural cares of life. But verse 6 but at midnight there was a shout. Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. See, at the midnight hour, when darkness is increasing, and I, I, I mean, if we're not there yet, I mean, we're not there yet, but we're fast approaching. I mean, how much further depravity can we get? I guess I don't want to know. But, I mean, we are fast approaching that dark midnight hour when God is releasing his messengers, his forerunners, anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah. 
And they're saying, behold, the bridegroom comes. Behold, the bridegroom comes. And I'm telling you prophetically, behold, the bridegroom comes. He's coming more soon than we realize. Yeah, but he said that 2,000 years ago, and everyone in that generation thought he was coming. And everyone in the generation since has thought he was coming, and he hasn't come. I'm telling you, behold, the bridegroom comes. The bridegroom is coming. He's coming at an hour that you do not expect. And the question is, have you developed an internal relationship with him by the indwelling Holy Spirit who is the oil that keeps your lamp burning and your light burning for him? Have you developed that internal intimacy with the Holy Spirit? That inward, intuitive knowing of connection to God in heaven by the Spirit of God who dwells in you. Have you developed that secret place relationship with him? Verse 7. Then all those virgins, the foolish and the wise, they trimmed their lamps. In other words, they were trying to make their lamp shine. They were saying, okay, turn it on, turn it on, turn the light on. The whole church at the end of the age is going to rise up and they're going to attempt to make the light of their first love for the bridegroom to shine. But some are not going to be able to do it. You can't just say, Jesus, I love you, and he's your first love. It's, it's far deeper than that. A first love relationship with him is far deeper than just saying, Jesus, I love you. It's far deeper than going to church. It's far deeper than even reading your Bible. It's an inward relationship with him by the Spirit. And that inward relationship causes the light that is in us to shine brighter and brighter and brighter outwardly so as the darkness around us increases. I'm telling you, though darkness is rising up, God's glory is going to shine in his wise virgins. I want to be a wise virgin. I remember in 1996 when I first read this, and I realized, no, Jesus is not talking about saved versus unsaved. He's talking like that has always said for many years, the parable of the ten Christians. He's talking about not saved versus unsaved. He's talking about wise Christians versus foolish Christians. This is not about losing your salvation at all. This is about whether or not we're made ready as the bride of Jesus Christ. I remember reading this in 1996. I remember exactly where I was when the light came on and I'm telling you, the fear of God came into my heart. And I realized if I don't take drastic steps, if I don't take drastic steps to change my life, I will naturally gravitate to being a foolish virgin. And so that shook me. It shook me to the core of my being. It shook me and I realized, okay, I've got to take drastic steps. I've got to make sure this, my relationship with Jesus is the most important thing in my life and reorient everything around that relationship with him. Look what verse 8 says. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. There is going to come a crisis at the end of the age. When the shaking increases, those who do not have that internal history with God are going to rise up and they're going to realize, oh God, I'm not ready. I am not ready to meet him. I am not ready to see him. I have lived my life selfishly pursuing my own interests, my own desires, my own way. I have not prepared myself for him. And they're going to be this, this great shock is going to come into the church. And they're going to go to those wise virgins and say, give us some of your oil. My lamp's going out. My light's going out. My passion's going out. My first love is dying. Give us some of your oil because my lamp is going dim. My oil has run low. 
And the wise virgins are going to say, what you're asking for is simply impossible. I cannot give you my relationship with God. You have to develop that on your own. I cannot give you intimacy with God. I cannot lay hands on you and say, I impart an intimate relationship with God to you. It just doesn't happen. Gifts can work that way. Anointings can work that way. But an internal relationship with God in the secret place can only be accomplished and established by you and God in the secret place. Your wife can't give you that. Your father can't give you that. Your brother can't give you that. Only the Lord can give you that relationship in the secret place. And so there's going to be this great crisis that rises up in the church at the end of the age when the church realizes, okay, signs of the times are telling us everything in biblical prophecy is being fulfilled. We're seeing right now the end of the age unfold. The bridegroom is coming. Oh, God, I'm not ready and they're going to go to the wise virgin to say, give us oil. And they're going to say, I'm sorry. There might be some time. There might be some time for you to go to the dealers yourself and learn to develop that own internal relationship with God. But I'm not sure if there's enough time. And sure enough, verse, verse 9, the, the wise aunt, that's what the wise said. The wise answer, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Verse 10, oh, it breaks your heart. The saved, justified, heaven-bound, but foolish Christians in the church, while they were going away to begin developing that secret relationship with God, that internal intimacy with him, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, the wise virgins, went into the wedding feast and the door was shut. There's mystery here. There's mystery in this verse, for sure. I'm not going to go into different interpretations of what all I think that means. I'm just going to say this. I don't want to find out the hard way what it means as a foolish virgin to have the door shut. I hope you don't either. I, I, and I, and I'm not talking about like living in this. Some people can live in this like crazy fear of judgment that actually causes them not to have an intimate relationship with God. I'm not talking about this fear of judgment, fear of condemnation or whatever, but there is a fear of God that is healthy, that's needed, that's like, God, I don't want to do anything that would displease you. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you. Verse 11, later the virgins, the other virgins came up saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. Verse 12, but he answered and said, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Now, I, I just, I personally don't believe this is the Lord saying, you're going to go to hell. I, I don't believe that. I think he's saying that you as a, as a Christian, you did not pursue an intimate relationship with me. And I believe the Lord is saying in this that I don't know you, meaning I didn't know you in that secret place relationship. It's 1 Corinthians 8 I'm thinking off of memory. I think it's verse 3 where the Lord says, those who, those who love the Lord, the Lord knows. See, the Lord really knows those who truly love him. Now, God would want to bring us into a love for Jesus Christ that is greater than our soulish love. I was saying this during the worship, but it's very important that we understand this. We think God is only interested in us just in our own soul loving him. But no, God's desire is for the very love of the Father. 
the very love of the Father before time and creation that burned in his love for the Son, that that very fiery love would be placed into us by the Holy Spirit. And then from the inside out, the Holy Spirit's love would flow outward into our heart, burning our heart, so that now supernaturally, me and you together, we are loving God expressed through our own unique personalities through our soul. We are loving God with everything in us, but it's not a selfish, soulish love. It's a love for God empowered by God's love for God. That's where God wants to bring us. A passion for Jesus that is supernatural, a passion for Jesus that burns by the very fire of God himself in our heart. It's like the Lord told the foolish virgins, my paraphrase, this is my paraphrase. I don't know you, I didn't know you intimately in the secret place. You placed other things above me. You placed your ministry above me. You placed your job above me. You placed sports above me. You placed friendships above me relationships, your children, uh, your parents. You placed other relationships above me. And the cares of life distracted you from the secret place of intimacy with me. Let me just say this, because I feel like some people are thinking, coming under some conviction, don't let it shift into condemnation. Like, okay, Lord, how am I going to, there's no way I can do this. I mean, <clears throat> I've got a job and it's just, you know, I work like 60 hours a week or I got kids and, you know, it's like, Lord, have you ever seen what it's like in my house? It's crazy. How in the world, Lord, am I supposed to have an intimate time with you in the secret place? Look, I mean, just my life is just so crazy and out of order. See, what I found is if you will be faithful in the five minutes God gives you. If you will be faithful in the 15 minutes God gives you. If you will be faithful in the 30 minutes God gives you, whether it's in the shower, whether it's driving in your car, whether it's exercising, whether it's cutting the grass, whatever, doing housework, whatever. You will, if you will take the time God gives you and you will be faithful to that, he will give you more and he will give you more and he will give you more. I've seen it in my whole life, or, or I've seen it in my own life, is when I first started this back in 1996, I was shaken to the core going, God, I've got to know you. I am going to be a foolish virgin if I don't reorient my life. And so, you know, I would realize, okay, I would, I, but I got to work and my life's crazy and all this stuff. Lord, how am I going to get there? And it's like, the Lord's like, if you're faithful with that very small time I give you, I'm going to give you more. And I've seen it played out in my life. If you don't get under condemnation, I think what God wants more than anything is for you to take it so serious that you prioritize it. See, you will make a priority for exercise or you'll make a priority for a game you want to see or you'll make a priority for getting together with friends or family. That same type thing needs to be in your relationship with God to say, hey, this, from this time to this time, every day or three times a day, nothing is going to get in the way of that. I am blocking it out. I am putting boundaries around it because this is precious to me. <clears throat> Verse 13, the Lord says, he concludes this parable. Be on the alert then or watch therefore. See, if this is really talking about saved versus unsaved, the Lord would not have concluded this with a call to watch and be ready and be on the alert. He would have said, you need to be born again. You need a new spirit. And he didn't say that. And we can confidently say, in my opinion, that he's, he's saying to us, he's saying to the sleepiness, to the sleeping church, watch therefore, be on the alert. Shake off the slumber. Like, like he told the church of Sardis, wake up. Wake up. Watch. 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 Li Listen, life goes by faster than you realize. 
I mean, if you're over 40, you probably realize that. If you're approaching 50 like I am, you really realize that. I think if you're probably in your 70s, you're like going, you have no idea what you're talking about, Brian. I mean, it flies. Life goes by so fast. Listen, I've made a ton of stupid decisions in my life. Ask Angie. She'll tell you like a ton of them. I mean, I've made so many stupid things. Like She's like, what were you thinking? I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. She's raising two kids, basically. But, you know, the, the, the wisest decision I've ever made was to say, I am not going to be a foolish virgin. I am going to be a wise virgin no matter what. No matter what. And I made this decision back in the mid-90s. No matter what, I am going to be a wise virgin I'm going to say, I'm going to lay down all the other things and let them take second place so that I can develop this internal relationship with the Lord. And I've been going down this path since the mid-90s. Honestly, it's so deep, it's so rich, it's so incredible, I feel like I'm just at the very beginning of it. I'm telling you, you will not get bored doing this. I assure you, if you have a fear of God, if I follow God wholeheartedly, it's just going to be boring. It's just going to be boring. I can just hear my daughter saying, oh, that sounds so boring. Dad, that's so boring. I assure you, a relationship with God is anything but boring. I'm telling you the depths to this. There are no limits, literally no limits to the depths of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about before you go to heaven. I'm telling you, we have access to God the Father, God the Son in the throne room by the indwelling Holy Spirit who connects us to the deep things of God and reveals them to us in our spirit. You will not be bored pursuing an intimate relationship with him. And so as we bring this message to a close, we've been really looking at God's eternal purpose to provide his son with a bride who is equally yoked. As we bring this to a close, is I just want to encourage you, just, just to ask a question. It's kind of been said so many times today, but how are you going to respond? See, what action are you going to take? What steps are you going to change? What are you going to prioritize in your life? What are you going to stop doing and start doing? See, God wants to arrest us with this pursuit that says, I am going to go after this call to be a wise virgin, to be the bride who's made herself ready. I am going to respond to be a wise virgin, to get oil for my lamp. See, how will you respond to this call and this invitation Matthew 22, many are called, but few are chosen. It's not because God doesn't want to choose you. I would say it like this, many are called, but God chooses those who choose him. Many are called, but God chooses those who choose him. And not in a half-hearted way, in an all-consuming way. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we, I just want to thank you for the, the unique anointing that has been on this service today. It was not what we were planning for the 4th of July. I thank you that you came to us, Lord, and uh, you spoke in a strong way, Lord. We appreciate your kindness to us. We appreciate, Lord, your discipline to us, Lord. And Father, I just pray right now that everyone who, would, who is listening in live or on per, in, online or in person, Lord, that you would move on our hearts, Lord. Lord, would you move on our hearts to make you, the first love of our lives, in priority, in passion, in experience, in, in the way we spend our time, 
even our money. Lord, would you reorient us to be that? In the name of Jesus, amen.